teach culture. So it's not something um, you are born with and then it's not dynamic. Sorry, slides are not changing. Okay, number one, uh, as I said before, culture is a system. It is a tool and it is learnable. Uh, I'm emphasizing this because this will be the framework with which we are going to do our analysis in the course of the conversation today. Number one, culture is a system. So uh, if you look at this Johnson and Scholes cultural web, you will see the various components of culture. It's about the stories. What stories do people tell about the organizations? Who are the heroes? If you think about countries, for instance, we have national heroes, Namdia Zikiwe, Awolo, all these great people uh, we talk about, and we try to emulate them. So they are like um, the ambassadors of culture. Uh, and culture, it's also, for stories, it also has to do about um, the, the heroes and the villains. So what behaviors um, make Nandia Zikiwe, for instance, great? And the villains we might have had in our country, um, what behaviors make them villains? And what stories do we tell about them? Same in organizations. Any behavior you promote, um, I mean, if you say you don't believe in poor customer service and you are promoting people who deliver poor customer service in a way you are entrenching that culture. Culture is also about symbols. Uh, the, or the dress code in an, uh, an organization. It's not by chance that organizations like Google and Facebook and other companies in Silicon Valley uh, have a dress down culture. It's not just about the physical look, but it's about a mindset, a mindset of collaboration, of fun, which they believe helps unlock creativity, you know, and unlock innovation. It's about rituals and routines. Uh, what do we do every day? What are the, what's the, what are the patterns of systemic behavior? Uh, if it's about customer service in a bank, it begins from the security man at the door. It, 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 it's also uh, about how clean the bathroom is, but how courteous um, uh, the teller is and so on and so forth. How do they behave on a daily basis? And it's also about power structures. How are, who are the powerful people? How are decisions made? Uh, in some organizations, decisions are decentralized. So there's a consensual system of decision making. In other organizations, it's command and control. Um, for instance, the military is hierarchical, you know, um, and power structures also have a relationship uh, with organizational structure, which is the next point. So how your organization is structured helps influence culture. Is it a command and control system? Is it a collaborative system of decision making? And all of these um, will help determine how the guy on the shop floor, how the guy at the coal face uh, behaves. So it's all holistic and as we uh, move along we are going to see various examples of the people that are doing it well and the people doing it wrong. I'll begin uh, our culture story in New York City. So in the late 1980s and early 19, 1990s, New York was the epicenter of crime in America. You know, lots of muggings, lot of, lots of mother um, people, uh, petty crime, antisocial behavior. And, you know, the city was wondering how best to help to fight crime in the city. Uh, is it about increasing jail term? Is it about uh, raiding homes and seizing weapon, weapons and so forth? Uh, what should be the approach that will help drive down the crime rates in New York? And then they hired this brilliant man called uh, William Bratton, uh, known as Mr. Zero Tolerance. He did a lot of things to fight crime, but some of his uh, methods were unorthodox, okay? So he, he, graffiti, for instance, New York has a, had a culture of spraying graffiti on trains. He banned, he banned that, he, he cleaned off uh, graffiti from trains. And, uh, you know, you also had people dodging fares. You can see this guy jumping over the turnstile, not paying his, uh, his transportation fare. And, you know, William Bratton clamped down on this. And people, we are wondering what's going on. Isn't this man going to sit, seize weapons and, you know, um, push for an increase in jail term? How is this going to reduce murder in New York? Uh, we are going to see in a minute. Uh, a couple of years after he joined, you can see violent crime falling in New York. You can see serious crime falling precipitously uh, in, in New York. And... Um, 
it's strange. Why is it these methods like cleaning graffiti that are helping, you know, change the situation in the city? But before I give you the answer, I'll give you another example. Uh, a football club in England, uh, Leeds United, some of us might know Leeds, went into relegation in 1994, described as the deepest sleeping of England's giants. And uh, the management for years tried to revive the club, to change the culture in the club. Successive managers were hired and fired um, without much prog progress until Marcelo Bielsa, arrived at Leeds. Uh, some people nickname him El Loco, the crazy one. When he lands at Leeds, instead of talking about tactics and all of that, he did talk about tactics, but then he goes about checking counters, counters for dust, you know, asking that dust be wiped off surfaces. He prescribed the funds for the signage of the club. He got bigger beds for players. He's fixing bathrooms. He's improving air conditioning. Uh, uh, and then famously, he saw the mark of a, a boot, like a footprint on the wall, and he quipped that that's unacceptable behavior. This is part of the reason um, we are not succeeding in the field of play. Strange, isn't it? Uh, as some of us might know, Leeds uh, is back in the Premier League this year. They came very close last year, but this year the club has been turned around. And this sleeping giant um, is now playing in the big league. So what is the correlation between graffiti on trains and the crime rate of a city? How does wiping dust off surfaces translate to superior performance on the football field? Part of the reason is a theory I would like to introduce you to called the broken windows theory. Uh, this theory was developed by criminologists, and the essence of this theory is that if you allow low-level crimes in an environment, it encourages more serious crimes. If you have two buildings and one has a broken window and the other one does not have a broken window, the building with a broken window is more likely to be vandalized because there is something about that system, that environment that shows that crime has started and, you know, and signals for more crime to continue. So sometimes to change the big things is the small things uh, you have to fix. That's one of the lessons I'd like us to go away with um, today. Culture is systemic. That's the, that's the point we're on. So it's all about the system. It's not just about the tactics on the soccer pitch. It's, all, it's also about the, the size of the bed, the air conditioning, the, the attitude of the players. Do they come late for training? and so forth. If you allow laxity in small things, invariably it might uh, impact the big picture. I also like to talk about the cultural iceberg because the, 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 the behaviors we see on the surface, for instance, you come to a bank um, and service is not good, the cashier, the cashier is frowning uh, and so forth, or you go to a hospital and uh, the nurses or the doctors are not fast, they are not responsive, these are symptoms, not the underlying cause. The underlying cause will be the values that are acceptable in that organization. What values have the leaders drilled into people? What values uh, make the heroes? Remember the heroes and villains theory I talked about. What values are celebrated and what values uh, are punished? So systems thinking, number one point. That is why these architects, we are able to bring about a difference. If you want to fix culture, you have to think systemic. Um, there's a whole theory around systems thinking and how you know, fixing one symptom doesn't help uh, solve a problem. You have to look at the various moving parts. Number two point about culture, culture is a tool, right? Culture is a tool, not just in corporate organizations, but also in international affairs, in, in diplomacy, right? That's why we have uh, cultural organizations like the British Council, Goethe Institutes from Germany, Alliance Francaise from France, and so forth. Um, it's not because these countries want to go to the developing nations and spend money. I mean, it's part of it, they want to do good, but part of it is, in, is trying to transfer their culture to you, trying to make you experience France, even if you are in Lagos, by going to Alliance Francaise. 
uh, trying to make you speak the language because they believe that when there is a commonality in culture, they will be able to influence you. People get along with people that they have a common culture with, right? Um, in international relations, there's this theory called the theory of democratic peace. It is rare for democracies to go to war with fellow uh, democracies, right? It's usually democracies going to fight dictatorships because they have a commonality. They see themselves as one. Uh, in fact, one author took it a step further and said that no two countries that have a McDonald's have gone to war with each other. That's why I have the McDonald's logo there, just in case you are wondering. But then number two, in, in, in uh, the corporate context, culture as a competitive advantage. In a minute, we are going to be looking at organizations like Netflix, Amazon, Bridgewater, and so forth, but also our own GT Bank, to see some of the things they do right. Okay? Um, uh, someone famously said, you know, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And we're going to see how that happens in a minute. So first of all, for organizations, uh, I'd like to emphasize this point that the culture of organizations derive from their strategy. So in your organizations, if you want to change culture, don't just copy another organization's culture because it looks good. You have to think about your strategy. What am I looking to achieve? Strategy is about choices. What have we decided to do in this organization and how have we decided to reach our goals? I'll give you an example for airlines. Some airlines, um, they are selling for some airlines, their selling point is cost. They've decided to compete on costs. They want to be the cheapest uh, airlines uh, in, in the business. You know, uh, their customer service might not be great. I'm not saying that is good, but they've made the decision that our competitive edge will be cost. It means they have to pay a lot of attention to cultural change around how to drive costs. It doesn't mean they should ignore customer service completely, but it's about what you give the greatest focus, right? For some other um, airline, they might not want to compete on costs. I mean, our competitors might be cheaper, but we want to be known for great service. We want to serve you the three-cost meal. We want to play mood music on the plane. We want to provide Wi-Fi. All of that might make the airfare cost five times more, but we don't care. It's a, we are going to play in the space of service, all right? So that would determine the culture they look to, to build. So um, strategy and culture are interrelated, but strategy must not be seen as um, the quick fix, the silver bullets, because as Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you don't get your culture right, then your strategy will just will not be what the paper it's written on, and your values will just be a sign up on a wall, you know. So with uh, culture, you can unlock uh, the promise of strategy. So we are going to be diving into a few case studies, and in this section, I'm going to let you see some examples of organizations that get it right, and some principles um, that relate to culture that have helped some organizations win in the marketplace. The first thing I'd like to do is to introduce you to this book called Founders Mentality, all right? Uh, the idea behind this book is that mo the most successful organizations in the world are usually organizations that have um, a founder, a passionate founder like Jeff Bezos in the case of Amazon, or Bill Gates in the case of Microsoft. These people have a dream. They start out as one person, perhaps in a garage, they are the ones that turn, off the lights, turn on the lights when they come into the organization and turn it off when they are leaving. They have some values. They are usually insurgents. You can see insurgency in the first concentric circle. Insurgents are people who attack the status quo. Imagine what Uber is doing to taxi, the taxi business. You know, they are insurgents. They come in with their own culture, speed, agility. They disrupt the system. They provide extra value. They drive down costs and organizations begin to grow. Owner's mindset, that is what these founders uh, also have, is their own business. They take it as their own. And frontline obsession is about how um, you don't just make craft your strategies in the boardroom, but how you make the guy in the coalface, the guy in the field, 
um, able to execute your strategy. The Uber driver is part of the execution of Uber's strategy. And you can imagine the millions of drivers they are. For one-man businesses, it's easy for you to embody all these values, insurgency and so forth. But as the organization begins to grow, it becomes more difficult you know, to transfer these values to everyone within the organization. And Founders Mentality is about how to make these values stick, how to transmit these values within uh, the organization. And I'll be talking more about this in a bit. But before then, if you look at the outermost concentric um, circle, you're going to be seeing some, fact, some values that help organizations win. Bias for action. Organizations that go out to the fields and execute. Not having long meetings, not uh, developing fancy strategies. You can develop strategies till the cows come home, but if you don't go out and execute, you know, your strategy will not be what the paper is worth. And bureaucracy kills organizations. I can't talk about this enough. Whether it's in hospitals, whether it's in banks, you know, if you have a bureaucratic mindset, people don't move fast. Then sooner rather than later, a smaller company, an insurgent, is going to come in with speed and agility, disrupt the sector, and knock you out of business. So organizations must try to you know, transmit this culture of bias of action, but also speed and agility uh, to their employees. We all know Steve Jobs, the visionary, and his mantra was think small. He believes in simplicity. He, he, this was a culture he drilled down in the organization. And I recommend this book called Insanely Simple. Uh, go look for it and you read more about how simplicity was used to drive innovation in Apple. The story is told of uh, the iPad, how he insisted that the iPad should only have one button, you know, and he, keeps, he kept sending the designers back until they developed an iPad with just one button. Um, today, I mean, some devices don't even have a, a button, but think back to when they started. This was a big innovation. One thing he, he also pushed for was small teams. He believed in the power of small teams. He believes that a team of good, intelligent, smart people you know, can move with speed and agility and deliver. So in our organizations, we should also have this mindset. Again, I'm not saying we should copy exactly uh, what these, these uh, great people did. I'm only saying, you know, look at some of these values and then decide which will be of benefit to your organization. Um, yeah, so if, if a meeting should have three people and Bill Gates, and uh, sorry, Steve Jobs sees four people, um, he's going to ask the fourth person to leave. And um, you might have heard stories of um, his personality. He's not nice about these things, you know. So we have to be careful about what we, we the, the culture we inadvertently promote. In my experience in corporate organizations, you see mentors and organizations talking about visibility, be visible, be visible, be visible. I'm not saying visibility is not bad. But you might inadvertently create a situation where people are necessarily trying to be visible. People come to meetings, they don't have a point, they want to speak, to feel silences, to be visible, to be seen. And, you know, so that advice of be visible begins to backfire. It does have its merits. I'm not saying don't be visible. I'm just saying be wary when you, 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 you push things like this. Sorry, I set an alarm to let me know when it's... Uh, minutes. Um, so simplicity is it's, it's a big one. Amazon, the, the, I call uh, Jeff Bezos the alchemist because he believes so much in innovation, innovations and experimentation. Uh, he's a guy that is also a marathoner. He has long-term thinking, which is one value I'd like to talk about. Don't think just for the short term. Amazon has not paid a dividend to his shareholders. And on this page, I have a copy of a letter he wrote to, the first letter he wrote to shareholders, and he said to them, if you are the kind of person that wants dividends every year, please look for another company. He hasn't paid dividend for year, dividends for years, and yet, you know, shareholders have stuck with him. His stock price, you know, has been shooting up. Why? Because um, he's a guy that thinks long-term and invests towards the future. He always has this, he also has this day one philosophy. Remember what I talked about when I was talking about founders mentality. As organizations begin to grow, 
then there is a tendency to become bureaucratic. The one philosophy means always see yourself as being on the first day of the job. See yourself, always have the mindset of a startup, even if you are growing into a global corporation. Be smart, be nimble. The business doesn't allow PowerPoint presentations. Uh, you, might, you might have heard the story. You have to, before you come to a meeting with him, you have to write a paper where you really articulate your thoughts and your arguments, you circulate it, people will read the paper and then come into meetings for discussions. You know, that way um, it encourages decisions to be made at meetings because people have taken time to think things through. When you're writing, uh, it enhances thinking and, and you analyze your argument so that you don't come to meetings and then you are thinking on the fly while you're talking and, and you wind up wasting everybody's time. The Maverick, uh, Reed Hastings, as we all know, uh, Netflix is, is, is taking over. Um, recently, Reed wrote this book. It's one of the hottest books in town, No Rules, Netflix and the Culture of Reinvention. I also recommend it. Uh, this is where he outlines his philosophy. Uh, he's a man that believes in people over process. Um, most organizations pay their employees, not most, some, pay their employees peanuts. You know, they have a culture where employees are bullied. It's not the right place to work. Micromanagement is the order of the day. And you want to get the best out of people. Um, for most organizations, if not all, the people are the differentiators, you know? So you have to invest in your people. If you think you are saving money by paying people peanuts, you are going to get what you paid for. In Netflix, for instance, there's no limit to holidays. People are given freedom, think about it, to decide the number of holiday, holidays they are gonna take, uh, the number of days off. I know you might say, oh, if we did this in some organizations, uh, some people would take 365 days. But in Netflix, it's not the case. He trusts his people. He trusts that they will not abuse you know, that, that um, privilege. And so far, they've not disappointed him. Uh, the company is growing in leaps and bounds. And um, you can, in the interest of time, I'll move on. But I highly recommend this his book, No Rules. Another guy I'd like to talk about is the founder of Bridgewater Associates. Um, his name is Ray Dalio. He believes in radical transparency. Okay. He believes in Kaizen. Kaizen is com continuous improvement. Another culture that helps organizations grow is being able to improve, being able to track your progress, being able to learn from your mistakes. Uh, and then he also believes in our God, our algorithmic decision making, tongue twister. <laughs> um, how does this work? So in Bridgewater, it's not a democracy where everybody, yes, yeah, transparency, everybody can offer their ideas, but ideas are weighted. So if you give suggestions progressively and you've been making mistakes, if you give suggestions in, future, in, the, in the future, your past mistakes will be taken into cognizance. Your decision will be weighted based on your past errors of judgment, you know? Um, and it will not weigh the same as somebody who has a history of making the right call, you know? So let's see how this works. And one more thing is openness. He has a culture where he encourages even an entry level employee to tell him the truth, to call him out when he does wrong. You know, this might be, for some of us culturally, this might be strange because we respect the leaders and the elders a lot. And this is one more thing I'd like to touch upon. Sometimes the culture of a people, you know, as Nigerians, we are very respectful, which is great. For, we respect gray hair and all that, which is great. But it has some downsides in the context of our organizations, right? Um, Malcolm Gladwell, in one of his books, talks about, I think it was um, Korean Airlines, where yeah, we had lots of plane crashes until the organization brought in a consultant to sort of like look at the organization and see why this was happening and what the driver was. Because they had great planes, they had good safety and all of that. So the consultants did an audit and what they found was that almost in all cases, 
whenever the older, more experienced pilot with more flying hours was about to make a mistake, almost in all cases, the junior pilot saw that the older person was about to make a mistake, but wouldn't talk about it because he would think, okay, I've only been one year in the game. This guy has um, 5 million flying hours. He can't be wrong. Uh, and in their society, they also have this culture of difference to old age, dif difference to uh, experience, you know. And so they, 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 change, they try to change that culture to get young people to, to respectfully offer up their ideas. And guess what? The, the accident rates fell, you know. And since then, it, it has been a, a successful airline, no accidents. And, um, just because culture was fixed. So back to Bridgewater, this is the culture uh, Ray Dalio pushes. And in a minute, I'll show you an email an employee wrote, an employee wrote to Ray Dalio, who is the CEO of this organization. Ray, you deserve a D minus for your performance today in the meeting. You did not prepare at all because there's no way you could have prepared and being that disorganized. In the future, I would ask you to take some time and prepare. And maybe even I, I should come up and start talking to you to get you warmed up or something. But we can't let this happen again. If you in any way think my view is wrong, please ask the others and we can talk about it. Can you send this email to your CEO? If you're a CEO or a leader in an organization, can your reports send this to you. Radical transparency. So our, our, God, our algorithmic decision making of oh, this word. <laughs> so at meetings in this organization, everybody has an iPad. If your colleagues are offering ideas, we are rating their ideas. Is this idea assertive? Is it open-minded? Is this a poor idea? You can see this person got a three, this person got a nine. All employees are rating each other, as you can see here. At the end of the day, this is compiled, you know, and at the end of uh, certain periods, the organization will look at the history of how others rate you and the quality of your decision making. And in future, when you contribute, it will be weighted against, you know, the, the, the quality of prior uh, contributions. Again, I'm not saying you have to do this in your organization. I'm only, only saying it's a culture that helps drive openness and remove biases, because most times we believe we are right. It's good to hear what others think about us. The Explorer, GT Bank. Uh, GT Bank has been on the cutting edge of uh, innovation in the Nigerian uh, banking space. And as most of you know, uh, banks as we know them will be disrupted. They're already being disrupted. I have a bank account with uh, a bank in Germany called N26. When I set up this account, I picked up my phone, I opened the app, filled a form, somebody called me, asked me to scan my passport on the phone. I scanned my passport on the phone, account was opened, they mailed a credit card to my mailbox. They don't have um, one branch. Maybe they have a head office. They don't have one branch. I've operated that account for one year now, N26. I've never seen what their banking, their, their banking building. It doesn't exist. Um, so GT, I think this is where they are going. They launched this uh, Habari mobile uh, platform, and they are trying to move towards this direction where um, a bank is just a payment engine, right? and banks as we know it will be disrupted. So is your organization an explorer? Would you like to experiment? It's organizations that experiment and dare to fail, you know, that win at the end of the day. Culture is learnable, and you learn culture when norms are clearly defined in an organization. You have to make the norms clear. Number two, there has to be a, a consensus across board about the acceptable behaviors. If late coming, in your organization is unacceptable. It has to be broadly agreed. And when people are late, they have to be called out, you know? And people shouldn't be ashamed to call people out to report people in an organization that wants to grow. 
I give you an example, uh, Taiwan. You know the number of people that have died as a result of COVID. This is a country with, with uh, millions of people, uh, their population. I think they've had about six or seven deaths in Taiwan. It's for a number of reasons. I'm not saying it's all cultural, but part of it is a culture of calling people out. When people see you're not wearing a mask, they will take your picture and put your face up on some platform. You know, they are willing to report themselves. They have low tolerance for, for people breaking the rules. And in the developing countries, we also have to think about it. What is our tolerance threshold for corruption, for instance? What is our tolerance threshold for sloppy behavior? Okay, because the behaviors you don't call out, behaviors you don't put your, your foot down and draw the line in the sand in an organization and say this is unacceptable, if you don't do that, those behaviors will continue to grow, you know, and culture is transmissible. Soon you will have a contagion effect where, you know, more people look and they see their colleagues got away with it. They see the leaders are doing it and they begin to exhibit these sets of behaviors. All right. Um, so the last point, group members are willing to sanction others for non-compliance and reward them for compliance. Sanctions are important um, in organizations. <laughs> Sentiments aside, how, would, how then do we ensure that we embed the right culture in our organizations? I'm going to run through this fast because I have about two minutes before we open it up to questions. Number one, it has to be driven by leadership. Uh, for instance, Dora Akunili, the, the late uh, Dr. Dora Akunili, we saw what she did in NAVDAC. You know, she led uh, 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 from the front. Everybody saw her passion and commitment. Um, it will be interesting to see how much she was able to transmit her attitudes and values to other employees at NAFDAQ. Um, but she was a leader that led from the front. You have to analyze culture as it is now. So do a culture audit and see how do people behave. Because whether you like it or not, guess what? There's has a culture in your organization. The question is whether it's good or bad. It exists. So do an audit. There are online uh, platforms that help for that. Uh, uh, one of them is harvard.com. They'll have surveys and so forth that will help you do the audit. Number three, imagine the cu culture you want to create, okay? So uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So what's the culture you're, you're aiming for? You have to be clear. And then what is the difference, all right? What is the difference between the culture, the current culture in your organization, and the culture, the aspirational culture where you want to go. When you find a difference, then you work towards fixing it. Then you make an action plan. Establish the key issues to address, determine who should take action, and establish how you will track and measure changes. Um, of course, what's not measured doesn't get done. So have a framework for measuring uh, success or failures over time, so you can course correct. And I will end my presentation with a quote uh, by one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, Coach John Wooden. When you improve a little each day, eventually big things occur. Don't look for the big, quick improvement. Seek the small improvement one day at a time. That's the only way it happens. And when it happens, it lasts. Thank you. Osita, thank you. That was excellent. I learned so much.